Welcome to the latest episode of Five on the Floor on the Five Reasons Sports Network. You can also catch us every day of the week on Dash Radio. That's the Nothing But Net channel. So download Dash Radio and then search for Nothing But Net and you'll find us every day from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. You may be listening to us there right now, but if you're not, definitely get the app. We're there 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern every single day. Also check out FiveReasonsSports.com. Spell it out. F-I-V-E, ReasonSports.com. We're putting several new stories on there. Every time the Miami Heat have a game, a press conference, or anything, our guy Brady Hawk is putting his five takeaways on there. Also, all the latest on the Marlins COVID situation, uh, where it seems that pretty much every person in the entire organization has tested positive. So we're updating you on that, all the details there. And, of course, Tua has reported to Miami Dolphins camp, and we will have that every step of the way also check out all the great sponsors in the five reason sports network we don't play favorites but yeah this is definitely one of our favorites it's biscayne bay brewing company the official craft beer of inner miami those miami marlins and also five reason sports this is south florida's actual independent brewery biscayne bay is owned by local guys who employ people in this community to make their beer right here in south florida these guys are committed to our community and they support five reason sports so we can keep bringing you all the local sports content that you can handle if you care about supporting local business and drinking amazing beer grab their stuff whether it's marlin's lager miami pale ale or that tropical bay ipa we're going to have more on that because we're going to be doing something with Alex related to it. At all major retailers throughout South Florida, Biscayne Bay Brewing, it's the beer we're drinking at Five Reason Sports. One of the things you can do, if you're drinking uh, Biscayne Bay Brew, tag us on Twitter or on Instagram at Five Reason Sports. If it's on Twitter, we'll give you a retweet, make you famous. And now, today's episode. Welcome to Five on the Floor. A Miami Heat and NBA podcast from Ethan Skolnick with Alphonse Sydney, a.k.a. ALF954. Brought to you by the Five Reasons Sports Network. All right, Ethan Skolnick back. Here is today's floor plan. No ALF, no Alex. Got rid of both of them after that Daisy Duke, or I'm sorry, I did it again. Daisy Duck conversation that we had yesterday. So it wasn't Alex's fault, but he was there uh, with me and Alf. And so we sent them away. They'll be back later in the week. We're going to have Matt Moore. You know him as HP Basketball uh, on on uh, five on the floor tomorrow to take a look at the Nuggets and the Heat. Also has a relationship with Andre Iguodala. Should be some interesting stuff there. But today I've replaced Alf and Alex with Nikias Duncan. You can follow him at Nikias NBA, and also our guy Greg Sylvander. Again, you can follow him at Greg Sylvander. Um, I had to give up additional draft picks to get you guys. Um, in fact, I had to. I had to basically to get rid of Alf's contract. Um, I had to throw in cash. Uh, but I appreciate you guys. But, both but didn't we get the six year on our deal? That's right. That's right. You get the six year on your deal, so that well, you get the six year, but then you'll opt out after four, and just like LeBron and Bosch did, and you know. In LeBron's case, you'll leave us. So there you go. <laughs> but I, I like the trade, though. I like the trade tonight. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to dissect that garbage scrimmage that the Heat played today against Memphis. But we're not really going to look at it in the context of, you know, what it means to lose a scrimmage and basically have Dylan Brooks shoot you off the floor. Uh, but we're going to look at it in the context of the Heat's defense as a whole. Because when we left the Miami Heat – they were not a very good defensive team, um, right? Is that fair to say, Greg? Yeah, particularly as the season went on, it seemed like that became more and more a thorn in their side. Um, you know, the quick guards, they're going to haunt us forever. Um, and uh, that was definitely how the season ended. Um, I mean, wasn't the loss to Charlotte. Um, uh, that, that was like kind of the quietest, um, most forgiven loss ever. And I think that that was just another example of um, some of the defensive issues that we saw today. And remember in that game, Jimmy Butler didn't play too. So it's, you know, it, it sort of magnified the defensive problems. But, I mean, Nikias, how would you characterize, and then we'll get into some of the details of today, but how would you characterize the Heat defensively 
during this season? Is is it too much to say they were even average? Uh, I think they were right at average. I mean, in terms of defensive rating, they were hovering around. They were hovering between 14 and 16, especially after the um, turn of the new year. They got progressively worse as the year went on. Um, they just kind of bled points. The only thing that's really saving them is that while they're awful at defending shots at the rim, they've been pretty good at preventing them. So that's kind of the saving grace right now. Um, they do limit rim shots. Um, they do kind of coerce guys into taking mid-range jumpers, and that's kind of what you want, especially with Miami running as much drop as they do. But um, the defense is still concerning, to say the least. All right, so let's look at today in that context. Um, as you're watching this this scrimmage, but also watching Twitter, it's like Heat fans are reliving everything that happened during the season. Um, the inability to control the point of attack, the inability to close out on shooters, as we mentioned, particularly small guards. Um, I, I mean, how can this be fixed? I guess this is the question. I mean, I threw it out there on a poll, and I said, you know, can the Heat be a good defensive team with current personnel? And, of course, it's Heat fans, so 70% of them said yes. Um, mm-hmm. But if you're going to be playing Goran Dragic a lot, you're going to be playing Kendrick Nunn a lot, you're going to be playing Tyler Hero a lot, we haven't even gotten to Duncan Robinson – you're going to be playing these guys because of what they offer you offensively. Is it even possible, even though you can flip side to Butler, Bam, Iguodala, Crowder, is it even possible with this personnel this year, Nikias, to be a good defensive team? I would lean no, because I think the issues at the point of attack, they, they just aren't going to be solved with the personnel on the roster. Your two best options are Jimmy Butler and Derrick Jones Jr. in terms of guarding quicker point guards. Um, Jimmy can do it, but that isn't his forte. Derrick Jones Jr. can do it, but if you're giving him a lot of minutes, you're making it a lot harder to score, especially if you're playing him with Bam Adebayo and also Jimmy Butler. So I think Miami's issues defensively are going to come in the first 45 minutes of the game. The last three is when you get into more stoppages, the game slows down. Spo has a lot of options at his disposal to go offense, defense for some possessions. And I think that's where Miami can really lock in. But it's getting to that point that's going to be the issue because things just break down at the top. And it's just a lot of scrambling on the back end. And I'm not sure. they. I don't think they have the personnel to fix that. And now with such a long layoff, it's kind of hard to throw in a lot of wrinkles if you're trying to just find a quick fix. So let's look at the three guys that are most problematic here when we talk about point of attack, which we talk about Dragic, we talk about none, and, and to an extent we talk about Hero. Uh, Greg, are you, are, is, will it get to the point with any of those three guys that they're just not playable, it, even with as much as all three of them offer offensively? Not playable, I think, is probably just – by sheer numbers, it's not viable because that's basically so much of what you have um, in the backcourt, particularly with Gorn and Nunn. Um, I, I think that there are there are some scenarios where if a guy was shooting bad enough or making really bad mistakes, uh, turnovers, stepping out of bounds, doing all kinds of um, kind of making rookie mistakes in, in high uh, in playoff settings, that then maybe you could see them bury a guy for a game or two or for a series or something like that. But I think ultimately, uh, as Nikias has alluded to, like this is the personnel you got to go with. Um, I think today, though, specifically, I know we're not going to spend a lot of time there, but I think we should acknowledge that, you know, Memphis was the 21st best three-point shooting team in the league. They shot 35%, and today they shot 45%. So, like, there were some elements of today that were a little bit of an outlier in terms of, like, what Memphis really is. So I, I know that Mem- that Miami gave up those shots and get, they gave up those makes, but um, Memphis came out to win that game, and they had a chip on their shoulder. So there was also some intensity stuff, too. So I wouldn't overreact to it. Well, before I get to back to Nikai, so let's talk about the intensity stuff. And, and I understand that Memphis, like you said, chip on your shoulder, didn't like the way that Iguodala handled the situation in Memphis. Uh, you know, we're pretty clear about that. Brooks and Morant were both clear about that. And also, you know, you obviously had the issue. I, I don't think they had any issue with Jay Crowder. But then you had also, you know, Justice Winslow going there. And, you know, Justice seems to be playing with Heat fans on Twitter, even though he's not playing. 
on the court. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I do think there was some intensity stuff, but Greg, should there be like any concern that uh, we've talked up this heat team now for months, right. About what they were going to be in the bubble. If this situation materialized because of the coaching staff, because of the leadership, because of the continuity, because of the depth, because of the mix of players that they had. And so here they've got a third scrimmage. And I, again, I know it doesn't count. And you can even argue that the next eight games don't count that much, okay, because, the, you know, the seeding doesn't matter that much. But you come into this, this scrimmage, and they all talked yesterday about how this was a little bit of a proving ground. They wanted to see where they were. They want to see how they all look together. And then, like, it's not that they didn't play well. They just looked like they weren't competing in some spots. I don't want to overplay it, but I, it was a little, I will say it was slightly disappointing today. No, I, I agree. I mean, ultimately when they tout themselves um, coming into it with a certain mentality and obviously like we know that that's the Miami Heat's approach, no matter what, um, I, I don't think Spolstra would say that they came with the kind of intensity and, and approach that they would um, hope for, but this, uh, you kind of hit on it already, but um, the seating doesn't matter. So the games now, like, I really think that when the, when we call them scrimmages, I think people are watching them and thinking that they're preseason games. And I know that they're pretty similar in most ways, but the players have um, on certain, if you watch closely, they've kind of allowed wide open layups in certain points when guys are out on the break, there's not any really hard fouls. So I, I don't think this is a real representative sample of what it's going to look like when they go live. And even the first eight games, I feel like is going to have more of a preseason vibe. I think there's going to be games, moments, quarters, end of games that have the intensity that maybe we're conceptualizing, but ultimately that's not going to kick in until the playoffs. That's just my opinion. So that's where I'm getting a little reluctant to um, make any firm declaration on the first three games and particularly from the intensity. But obviously um, the, the one other thing I want to mention, and I'm long winded here, but the one part of it too, is that when you integrate a player like Bam Adebayo back onto your team, Anytime you put a piece back in that's that instrumental to everything you do, it's going to take a little bit to get um, acclimated again. So I just think that that should be considered too. And he was one of the better players on the floor today. And so, I mean, I, I think the, the, the one positive today was that Bam looked pretty good. But Nikaias, to Greg's point, though, about intensity, I wonder a little bit if players are going to be able to generate their usual intensity, even for particular situations – because there are no fans, because they're hanging out with these other guys in the bubble the entire time. Like, I, I think we're assuming that there's going to be a, a, you know, a switch that's flipped here. Maybe it doesn't happen in the regular season, but it happens in the playoffs. But it's such a new environment, and all the things that you feed off of in a playoff environment are not there. Do, do, do you think that plays into the, that will play into this at all? Um, I would probably slightly disagree there. I do think they're going to be able to flip that switch because I think kind of what uh what Greg alluded to, um, there have already been some moments and some quarters where things just kind of ramp up. And I mean, a part of that is it being into the rotation guys being in for most of those fourth quarters. But then you look at you look at the uh, the Rockets game from the other night where James Harden plays 36 minutes, he's like, hey, no, A, I want to win. B, I know I'm going to be playing these kind of minutes anyway once the regular season ramps up. I want to make sure that my body's right. So I do think that once the eight seeding games start, um, you're going to see varying levels of effort, I would say, or varying levels of urgency. Like Milwaukee basically needs a win and a Raptors lost to clear the number one seed. I think they're going to be working, making sure that everyone stays healthy through the eight games mm -hmm. before like a team like the Pelicans or something, they're really making a playoff push. They're going to be going after it all the time. And Miami has a pretty strong locker room and they've got a bunch of guys that want to get out there too. That's why, I mean, we know what heat culture means to this group. So I don't think it's going to be an issue with them in terms of intensity at all. Let's cycle back to the defense because whenever we talk about defense, you know, it comes down to what you're talking about. You know, one, you know, we talk about personnel, we talk about scheme, we talk about intensity, right? Like those are the three things a lot of times that lead to defense. Um, your view is that the personnel that they currently have is not going to be great defensively. Uh, we talk about intensity. That's really Spolster's job, you know, to get that going. And then scheme also to a certain degree. 
So let me ask you this about scheme, and then I want to get to some lineups and, and what Eric can actually do here to tinker. Because when I asked him the other day about, you know, the point of attack defense, he's like, well, you, you just hit – basically he said you hit on the problem. I mean, they know that that's the problem, okay? And, in fact, they don't like when you talk about any struggles against the three ball because – Eric's view on this is it's all starting at the point of attack and we're focusing too much on the finish of the play instead of the start of the play. Is there mm -hmm. anything he can do from a scheme perspective, Nikias, to protect some of the guys that, as Greg is saying, they kind of have to play just because of the composition of the roster and because they're all good offensive players? From a scheme, I feel like they've done most of everything they could do from a scheme perspective. Um, well, that would make sense with the roster anyway, because I don't think they can afford to go back to the aggressive blitzing style that we saw through the to the Big Three era, because they just Bam is great, but that's going to be taxing him a lot. I um, think the best I think the best that they could do right now is to be a little bit more intentional about um, cross matching. I think that's going to be your your best bet. Um, if Kendrick Nunn's going to be in there, you're probably going to want to put him on an off-ball guy. And your best bet really is going to be Jimmy guarding more guards at the starting in the starting unit, because I don't see, I don't think they're going to complete the goal from the drop. They really can't afford to do that. What do you think about and, the zone? Uh, I was just about to say, um, I feel like the zone is a fine changeup, but it feels like just watching different games across the league since the scrimmage has been going on, it feels like a lot of teams have been tinkering with zone. It's true. So I, th I think a lot of teams now have more reps against the zone since more teams are playing it. So for a team like Philadelphia specifically, Miami zone bothered them quite a bit in the first matchup, and then they started figuring some things out. And they still lost the next, they still lost that next matchup against them. But it's not a matter of figuring out where to create those mismatches. So I would say Philly, Philly specifically, since they may be the first round matchup, I would imagine that they've already watched a bunch of film. So I don't think the zone is going to be the change up that Miami would want it to be. I think it's just going to be kind of sticking to your guns in terms of the scheme, maybe rejiggering some matchups and just hoping that you execute better. Let's look at the rotation a little bit. Um, you mentioned Jimmy guarding some point guards. How far can you push the the playing of the better defensive wings thing? In other words, <laughs> yeah, because I always think it's like it's like you're sort of getting to the edge here where it becomes counterproductive, right? So <laughs> if if you're going to take the smaller guards off the floor and you're let's say you're going to play Jimmy with Iguodala and Crowder and Bam, okay, so you're basically playing four you know, plus defenders, okay? Or substitute DJJ for Crowder, maybe, okay? Or something along those lines. Is that feasible from an offensive perspective? In other words, where is the balance? Because this roster is very clear, right? You have two guys who are two-way players, okay? Uh, although, obviously, you know, both Jimmy and Bam, you know, Bam needs to shoot more and Jimmy needs to shoot better. But they're two-way players. And then you've got guys who are either on one side or they're on the other side, and there's not a lot in the middle. Mm -hmm. How would you balance that? Can you play four of the defenders together at any time and still generate offense? I think you can. You would just – Duncan Robinson would just have to remain the best shooter in basketball. Correct. That's it. With, you, need, you need a guy to be unconscious from three and a guy that they can't leave alone. That's really the, the – whoever that ends up being, you hope that guys like Crowder can take a step in and, and shoot well, but you know that the regression could come there. So, um, and Andre Iguodala, you're not looking at it as an outside threat. So, you you have to plug in a guy that's going to hit shots and, and space the floor and keep the team honest. And there's no other guy but Duncan Robinson that really – that. I think will um, be a, a significant enough threat consistently to make that kind of stuff work. But if you shorten the rotation, like I, I would not discount, I know Spo's talked a lot about going deep and I think in the eight game stretch, they are going to go deep. But when the playoffs come, I would not be surprised if he's playing seven and a half, eight in some games, depending really? on matchups. Um, so I, I think that that could be something that they look at too, in order to try to shore up some of the defensive stuff. Well, we saw 11 today that, the, the core 11. I mean, I, I know Heat fans want to see Akpala, but 
uh, you know, again, I, I think they're going to wait. I, I've said that I thought that there could be a role for him. I know the tendonitis, but I feel like the tendonitis was convenient a little bit because it, it, it allows they, – they know it's out there. They, they, I mean, if you go on every Heat post on Twitter, free KZ. I mean, they, the Heat recognizes what's going on. And so Spolstra addressed it a little bit the other day with the tendonitis. But I do feel like, you know, they have their 11. I saw DJJ got in before Jay today, which surprised me a little bit. And Olenek was actually the 11th man, but he's going to play in all these games. I just think it's going to be hard – I just think it's going to be hard to get down from 11 to eight. You know, I, I think that's going to be uh, a bit of a challenge. I'm going to put you both on the spot here. And, and I guess I'll have to answer the question too, because I, I don't want you guys to be on an Island. Who is the single biggest problem for them defensively right now? Is it Goron? Uh, I, I think the answer is just whoever's in it point guard at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, when it's the starting line, it's Kendrick Nunn. And when Goran Dragic comes in, it's him. With Tyler Hero probably trailing um, very closely behind those three. Yeah, it it's, just, it, it's those two small guards. That's You have to go with one of the two. And, and what is if that's the case, does that change the direction that you go in the offseason? This is because Heat fans always want to look ahead. But we've talked about, you know, again, Nunn possibly being a piece to get you another piece. But we've also talked about Dragic as someone they want to bring back, who I think they should bring back, maybe with a balloon payment for one year and then finish his career here, uh, which he wants to do. But we've also talked about how Nunn and Dragic have not looked good together offensively when they play together. Ultimately, Hero is probably going to be a starter for this team, which means Nunn probably goes to the bench, which means you got to figure out what to do with with uh, you got to figure out what to do with Dragic and Nunn. I mean, if <laughs> Does this change your thinking in terms of what you do? Because if you can't play them consistently, if none doesn't get better, I don't think Goran's going to progress much defensively now going forward. Okay, there's been slippage. So does it change the way you look at things? I think it has to on some level. I think that um, in a perfect world, you bring back Goran and he's that six man, you know, and Kendrick Nunn continues to develop and, and all that works out. But ultimately they're kind of in a perfect world, um, in a realistic world, they're, they're, they're kind of the same player in, in, in the, the purpose that they would serve. And that's kind of, in, in my opinion, a six man um, kind of scoring spark plug off the bench combo guard. Uh, so, so there is a question mark about if you get, if you go through this run in the playoffs and you clearly see that that's a defensive issue that cannot be solved and they're not providing enough offense for you to be a proficient enough team to advance far in the playoffs, you have to think about that money that you would allocate to Goran Dragic and you could even potentially have to offer um, it to him. If he takes a lower number, it could be for more years or the high number for one year, but Ultimately, you're still tying up a lot of resources when you have Kendrick Nunn, who's on a minimum deal that would f- that would fill that same spot. Would it be better to take that money and allocate it towards uh, a big man that can help with some of the rebounding stuff or whatever the, the position is or another point of attack defender? You know what I mean? Like that, that could end up being it as well. So there is a big question about that and that, but I don't think we're evaluating that until we see the playoffs. What do you think, Nikaias? Um, I feel like in the case of Dragic, at least, I feel like there's enough of a sample to know that that isn't really tenable long term. And that's I, that's partially why him developing an off the dribble three over the last year and a half has been such a huge development, because that's really been the shot that has given him enough surplus value offensively to make him worth it. And I, I mean, we're going back to last year. Um, that was really the first time that spoke consistently hid him defensively. The year before that, he guarded point guards most of the time and got baked. And so I think moving him to the bench was another way to kind of hide him from those tougher assignments. And I don't see how that gets better as he gets older, especially since we're going into a free agency class that is, it isn't great. And the money's kind of up in the air with the pandemic and the effects of that. So I feel like this is a natural – this will be a natural end point for these two. I don't see – I just don't see the long-term role for Gorn. And if Kendrick Nunn kind of has those same issues at the point of attack, it would make more sense 
for Miami to kind of slide Kendrick into that six man role Mm -hmm. and then look for a guy that can defend point guards and also shoot. Um, If we're going back to the Grizzlies game, DeAnthony Melton is going to be a restricted free agent this summer. And he's the kind of guy that can thrive off of a a wing initiator like Jimmy Butler is. A guy that can knock down spot up threes and can absolutely hound guys at the point of attack. That's the kind of guy you need at the point guard position. So, uh, so let's say, and then we're going to move on to some other general NBA stuff here in a second. But I, I, does that mean it was you're looking at free agents, Greg, going forward or players that you could possibly, or even trade targets that really the types of players we should be talking about, we're, we're talking about all these flashy two guards. And I know Oladipo is a plus defender, obviously when he's healthy, but we're talking about all these flashy two guards. Should we be talking about Drew Holiday and, and Kyle Lowry more? Because it seems to me like for what this team actually needs that, you know, they have plenty of scoring. Like, I mean, Bradley Beal obviously is like, you know, the cherry on top. Okay. Cause he's elite as a scorer, but like this team doesn't struggle to score. This team struggles to defend like the types. Of, and I'm not saying Toronto's given up on Lowry, obviously, but they got a decision to make with Van Vliet also, and it's going to get expensive. Wouldn't that make more sense? Wouldn't Drew Holiday make more sense? I mean, they're elite. They have been elite point of attack defenders over the course of their career. I mean, yeah. As, as the roster is presently constructed, I think that there is absolutely a case to be made for uh, targeting the Drew Holiday, Kyle Lowry types um, throughout the league, as opposed to um, a player like Demar Derozan, for instance, or something like that. If you're going for a short term option. But all that is short term, and we're all talking about it in the context of the way that the roster is constructed today. I think ultimately while we, why we hear so much about these other flashier scoring type two guards, whether it's Oladipo or it's Donovan Mitchell or it's Bradley Beal, is that the hope is, is that you acquire a player that kind of transcends all of this um, situational matchup dependent roster talk and you just get such a good player that then you can plug and play a specialist and it works out because you have such um, upper echelon talent surrounding. Uh, so, so I think that that's probably the preferred path, but if that's not the case, if it's not realistic to get a Bradley Beal or a Victor Oladipo um, early, I think that definitely on a one year approach, looking at, at, at guys that are going to expire in 2021, but fill that role is probably smarter than some of the, um, you know, the DeMar DeRozan type options that are more scores. I mean, money aside, Nikias, and obviously we got to get into contracts and money and all that sort of stuff. If you put, I mean, you sub out, you know, a couple of the guards that they have now and you plug in Kyle Lowry at this stage of his career, how much does it change what this team looks like? If you're swapping out Nunn and Dragic for Kyle Lowry, I think Miami's easily the second best team in the East. And I think they have – they already have a puncher's chance of beating Milwaukee, but that series becomes a lot closer. And they've liked him before. I mean, they, they you know, they made a run at him before. So I, I, I think it's – I was told um, that – two of Jimmy's favorite guards in the entire league are Kyle Lowry and Drew Holiday. So that that's why I keep bringing them up because it, we were talking a lot about Holiday and people close to Jimmy were saying, take a look at Lowry. <laughs> I mean, he loves Kyle Lowry. So I, I think it's, I mean, similar mentality and obviously he's one at the highest level now. So something to look at. All right, we're going to talk more about some general NBA uh, and we're, yeah, we're going to get into Dion waiters in a second, but first another of our great sponsors. I want to introduce you to another of the great new sponsors of the Five Reasons Sports Network, and it is a sponsor that would be important in any time if you want to have a beautiful workspace, but it's especially important now when you need a safe one as well, and that's safecubbies.com, which offers modular office solutions designed to elevate your open office into a modern and safe environment at any budget. You can personalize your workspace with options like whiteboards, magnetic panels, acrylic sheets, and graphic branding. Most 
most of the surfaces are non-porous for easy cleaning and can be removed or replaced within minutes. Now this is for workplaces. They've got a bunch of different options on their professional series, but also they've got private room solutions, dividers and sneeze guards, and they have a classroom series as well. So if you're involved with the school, this is definitely something your school should check out, of course, if we have school in the fall. And that's the point here. We were entering a new normal period with COVID-19. SafeCubbies.com, which is locally owned, is the place that you want to go. The phone number is 754-216-1071. Again, that's 754-216-1071 or SafeCubbies.com. All right, Ethan Skolnick back on five on the floor. I got Nikias Duncan. I've got Greg Sylvander. Um, I want to go around the league first, and then we'll we'll have some fun with Dion at the end. Uh, give me a couple. Of, I mean, we've we've all been watching these bubble scrimmages. Um, I mean, Carmelo looks lean. I mean, there's there's a lot of things that have sort of jumped out as you watch, you know, some of these games. Give me a couple, Nikias. Like, who looks like they could surprise here? Uh, based on what you've seen. Okay, so I'm just going to completely ignore Denver because I don't want to get yelled at. Um, So (laughs) with that being said, uh, Phoenix has been a lot of fun. DeAndre Ayton is good. Devin Booker remains very good. Mikael Bridges is finally starting to get some of the Twitter love that he's deserved. He is a tremendous defender, and some of the offensive stuff is starting to come around with him. He's hitting threes. He's showing some off-the-dribble stuff. Um. I don't think Phoenix is going to have a real shot at challenging for eight just because they're already so far behind. But they look I feel like they've looked the best out of those bubble teams out, on the, out in the West. Um, the Pelicans have also looked pretty good. Um, they've had some fun stuff with Frank Jackson off the bench. Um, to kill Alexander Walker, a guy I like pre-draft. He's looked pretty good. Um, obviously still waiting to see what Zion's going to look like. He just got – he just got cleared from quarantine today, so um, probably going to be fun watching that New Orleans Pelicans team so far. But I would say um, New Orleans and Phoenix have been the most interesting teams I've seen. Well, what about of the of the of the contender uh, teams? I know Milwaukee came out and put up like 140 in their first mm-hmm. game. Obviously, Philadelphia. We've talked a lot about them. Uh, we haven't talked quite as much about Boston of late or Toronto. Any of the contenders jump out at you? Um, Toronto looks as scary as they know, as they usually do defensively. Um, Marcus Hall looks pretty good out there. Um, beyond that, Milwaukee, the fact that Brooke Lopez is hitting threes again should terrify everyone. Because I feel like Milwaukee's already been the best team in the league. And that's with Brooke Lopez shooting like 27% from three this year after a pretty solid season last year. If Brooke Lopez is back to hitting threes above the break, I there's just no way to guard Milwaukee at that point. Mm-hmm. I think what, Paul what? George too. At, from like mm-hmm. when we're talking about superstars, I was I've been su- pretty surprised at um, at Paul George. I, well, I I, I want to get into the Clippers a little bit with you guys because I, obviously there's a lot of talk about Lou um, and Magic City and all the rest of that stuff. But also the one thing about the Clippers is we we didn't really see them play together in a sustained way this season because of the way that Doc was staggering his two biggest stars, um, you know, and obviously they don't have Shamit. I mean, they, you know, they, they have, they've had guys in Beverly left the bubble and, and, you know, and, and obviously Lou left the bubble. Uh, would you, what would it take to make you make the Clippers the favorite in the West for you, Nikias? Um, They're already my favorite in the West. Mm-hmm. I think they're, if they stay healthy and if they could get Landry Shamit back, uh, they have some really funky stuff they can do in their closing lineups. They can go – it feels like they can go 15 or 16 different ways and still overwhelm teams. They have the ability to go really big. They can kind of go small-ish with Montrezl Harrell at the five. If you want to go smaller than that, you can go Marcus Morris at the five and still have PG and Kawhi out there on the wings, Patrick Beverly hounding guys, and then the fifth guys, whoever you want to put out there. If Shaman's back, it's him. If Lou Will, Williams has it going, it's him. Um, they just have a level of flexibility with their roster that no one else in the West has. And they have Rodney Magruder, baby. This is true. He got culture. They, they got culture. What, what, okay, I, I tried watching Houston uh, the other night. Mm-hmm. 
That's a tough watch, man. I, I mean, I don't know if I have a bias. I'm not sure. I feel like teams that are playing small should be more fun. Uh, I'm just watching Russ pound, 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 pound. I'm watching James pound, 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 pound. Uh, I, I, I like what Covington's done for them since he's come over there. But, I mean, I, I, I just – I guess I heard that Tyson Chandler hasn't had a field goal since December, and he's their <laughs> only big. Uh, I mean, literally has not had a field goal since December. Can they – I mean, if, if they're matched up with Denver first round, if they're matched up, probably not going to be Utah. Probably it would be Denver, might be, might be the Clippers. They mm-hmm. slipped to seven, I guess, potentially. Uh, how dangerous are they? I mean, how, how does D'Antoni make this work? They're going to have to gun from three. Um, I'm, just, I'm seeing tweets now that Eric Gordon apparently has hurt his ankle. I'm not sure how serious that is. But if he's out, then that's obviously going to put a – throw a pretty big wedge into their plans this year. But um, as far as the matchup with Denver, I feel like they have just kind of terrorized Nikola Jokic so much on the offensive end. Um, I'm not sure that they have any fear of that matchup. Um, Jokic versus P.J. Tucker is going to be something interesting to watch. Jokic has gotten the better of him over the last couple of years on those post-up matchups. But Denver just hasn't solved how to defend James Harden. Um, they were actually the first team to basically trap him from half court this season. And then a bunch of teams kind of follow suit there. But I don't know if that's a tenable strategy for an entire playoff series. So I wouldn't worry too much about that matchup. Um, I do think if you're if they're facing the Clippers in round two, then that becomes a little trickier. Because when you can spend basically 48 minutes of throwing either Paul George or Kawhi Leonard on James Harden, and they're probably, I would imagine that they're going to throw their center on Russell Westbrook and just down to shoot. I think it gets really tough if they aren't throwing, if they aren't flame throwing from three. And Houston really hasn't done that this year. Um, I guess not even a dirty little secret, but they shoot a bunch of threes, but they don't shoot them well. They overwhelm teams with volume more than they do with efficiency. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if they, if they don't get hot from three, I do think the Clippers could win that series handily. Well, and the Clippers and the Rockets, if they end up facing off, there's going to be fights in that series. You got PJ oh. Tucker and you got Patrick Beverly <laughs> and oh, all that. And, and <laughs> yeah. like, and you know, just to close the loop on the intensity conversation we talked about and how the bubble kind of lacks some of what the, the crowd brings and that kind of stuff in the energy level. I think that the one thing about the playoffs, if, if you get two guys that are on some TJ Warren, Jimmy Butler stuff in a series, I do think that that's going to ramp up both sidelines, both benches, both lineups. And, and that could, you know how like late in every all-star game, the last couple minutes, everyone kind of locks in. I think that you could see an even intense, more intense version of that at the end of some of these uh, uh, seeding games. And then obviously the playoffs, it, it could be even more. So, so, so that's something to watch too. The chippiness will help. Well, I, I noticed this too. I was watching, uh, believe it or not, some baseball the other day. And as, as I'm watching, it, there was a, a, like a benches clearing thing where Christian Yelich was pretending that he was going to run out and fight. It was a Brewers Cubs game. And one of the things that Craig Council, our friend Craig Council, uh, said, uh, you know, that he's now the Brewers manager. He said, there's going to be more of this because the players can hear each other uh, because there are no fans. And, and I feel like the, the thing about the fan, obviously the viewers getting to hear the players has been overstated because it's going to be hard to hear the players when the broadcasters are constantly talking and they're pumping in some sound, a little bit of sound. But on the court and the benches are going to hear each other more. <laughs> Right. And that might lead to some like you're talking about, Greg, some more chippiness like that. There's nothing else. I mean, you know, when, when you're when you're on the court, I've, I've never really understood. I've always asked Spolster for this. How play? Because I don't think players ever hear him like because I've, I've sat courtside and I, I, I've, I've tried. To, you know, you see Eric screaming and he'd be like, right, you know, less than 30 feet from me. And I couldn't hear a thing he was saying. And I'm like how the hell is LeBron hearing it <laughs> over there on the court? And the answer was he's not, he's not paying any attention. Okay. And that's why Eric's waving his arms and everything else. But now, you know, you're going to hear this stuff because, you, because you don't have, you know, people forget like what 19, how loud it is with 19,000 people in a place screaming at the same time. So I do think it's going to lead to a little more chippiness. Uh, I'm with you on that. Uh, one more. And then we're going to devote the last segment of this to Dion and the Lakers. Uh, I was watching uh, watching Utah against the Heat, and the Bogdanovich loss to me is pretty significant for them. Um, 
can they recover from that? Do they have enough scoring to compete in the West? Uh, that's going to be a lot of Jordan Clarkson. And to be fair, to Clarkson, he has, he's been good this year. So I don't want to sell him short. But if you're relying on Jordan Clarkson and then you're combining that with what we've seen from Donovan Mitchell on the playoff setting so far, it's been a little bit up and down, which isn't entirely fair to him based on the points that he's had and some of the things he's had to deal with in the half court. Um, the Rudy Gobert thing has been a little tight at times. But um, I don't really see how Utah scores enough, not without sacrificing defense. Yeah, that, that's how they looked to me the other day, too. I, I, I guess since I didn't watch the Jazz enough this year, I didn't realize how important Bogdanovich was to them. But I can tell you that if you listen to that Jazz, we were listening to the Jazz feed, and the entire time, I mean, it was all they talked about for 40 minutes. Yeah. Was, right? Was how they were going to replace his his, uh, his time. And I, I know they have Inglis, and I, like you mentioned, Clarkson, but Clarkson shoots you in it, into it. He's going to shoot you out of it. All right, we're going to talk about another guy who can shoot you into – or out of a game and get into that a little bit. But before we do, I want to tell you about another great sponsor of the five reasons sports network. And that's Keystone chiropractic. That's our friend, Dr. Jonathan Chung. You know, did you know that exercise might be one of the best treatments for concussions? Years ago, concussions were treated by keeping you in a dark room and resting until your head felt better. The thinking has changed dramatically as research has proven that a light exercise program Two days after concussion actually improves recovery. If you've still been battling concussion symptoms for months after a head injury, getting the proper treatment can make your head feel better in as little as two weeks. Get more health tips like this and more by following at Keystone Neuro, that's N-E-U-R-O, or at Dr. Jonathan Chung on Twitter and Instagram. And the website, again, is chiropractickeystone.com. All right, let's get into it, guys, because our friend Justin Rowan up in Cleveland, uh, who has some fun with Heat fans sometimes, uh, tweeted that, and again, he's very familiar with Dion, and he tweeted that uh, Dion's going to turn a game in the playoffs, and my response was, which way? Um, <laughs> we've seen him and J.R. Smith look pretty damn good for the Lakers so far, two guys that were traded for each other in the 14-15 season because LeBron decided and David Griffin decided – that J.R. Smith was more trustworthy than Deion Waiters, basically. And they were pretty much right because they ended up getting the finals and turning that season around. Is, I guess the guys, is what Deion's doing in L.A. in this role sustainable? I mean, sure. Like, I guess the thing with Deion <laughs> and J.R., what they've done so far is that they've done what they always do. J.R. Smith hits contested threes. Deion Waiters – Operates a pick and roll, does those hang dribbles, and takes tough pull ups. It's just, it's all, it's really, it's really a matter of how much of a leash are you going to give them? Because for every 13 points and six minute stretch, Deion Waiters or J.R. Smith going to give you, they're also going to take some awful shots. They're going to clink off the rim. It's going to lead to some transition opportunities, and they're not very good at defending in transition. J.R. Smith's obviously a little better than Deion as a team defender, but that's really going to be the thing. Um, Deion yeah. Waiters does give them an, a level of shot creation that they just haven't had outside of LeBron on the perimeter. Like Rondo stinks. Alex, Car Alex Caruso is a good player, all memes aside, but he's still more of a guy that's going to connect you to the next guy more so than create for himself. Um, I don't think you want to give Quinn Cook a heavy dosage of um, ball handling reps at this point. He's more of an off-ball guy than an on-ball guy. So I think Deion Waiters gives them an element that they've been missing, and it's going to help in the three or four minutes that Frank Vogel feels comfortable taking LeBron to the bench. But I just don't think you can give either of those guys a really long leash. Well, that to that end, and again, Dion, you know, was brought in before, you know, they, they started losing guys, but JR was brought in after. Uh, the point's been made that they're not, they're not going to miss Rondo, right? Nikias? Yeah. Okay. That's pretty simple. Are they going to miss Avery Bradley? A little bit. And I say a little bit because the one thing that he is really good at and has always been really good at is point of attack defense. And while Caruso is good as that good at that too, he's not Bradley. So I do think they're gonna miss that, especially if they get Portland in round one. Yeah, that's they're going to miss Avery up. Bradley Howding, yeah. Damian Lillard. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I think that's 
The, the Dion and JR thing, I, and I know probably most listeners think that I'm immediately going to say something negative about Dion Waiters and his ability to contribute to a championship team, but this is the thing with both of those guys. They can do it for um, a subset of the schedule, like like this kind of scenario where you're going in for eight games in a playoff run um, and the, the world is watching. Like I think that that's like the perfect scenario. It's more about when you got to corral them guys for 82 and you got to figure out how to get them through January and February of a long season and those dog days. Like that's where it gets challenging to bring those guys along for the ride on a true championship level team in my opinion but to to get them geared up for this stretch and then playoffs and have them in 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 stretches contribute i think it's kind of the perfect scenario and if anyone's going to make it work we know it's going to be lebron well it is although he you know he can handle jr i mean he has a relationship with jr dion he couldn't handle the first time i but again a lot has changed i mean that was before lebron had won a championship in cleveland uh, it was he, he couldn't deal. He viewed Dion as a knucklehead, and it was addition by subtraction to get rid of him. Uh, but now I, I agree, he offers something that they need. You mentioned Portland. Um, so of all of those teams, you like the way Phoenix is playing, but they may be too far back. New Orleans, obviously, you know everybody wants Zion to get that eight spot. We saw Memphis today, uh, and by the way, that would be a problem with the point of attack too. Uh, which which of those teams can scare the Lakers? in the first round is it because to me it's just Portland right uh, I I'm torn between Portland and Memphis I think the Portland argument begins with Dame and to a lesser extent CJ just because they can make so many tough pull-up shots but also I feel like Memphis is just a better slash deeper team than Portland and I don't want to disrespect their front court depth just because they are, they have gotten Nurkic back. They've gotten Zach Collins back, but Portland's just so weak on the wings. And I do feel like there's a level of speed that the Grizzlies do have. They're a high variance club, but on the high end, if the Lakers are turning the ball over, I feel like John Morant is a guy that can kind of get to the basket whenever he wants to and kind of create open looks for others. I think Memphis is a better team, so I would lean them, but I do understand the Dame element of it all. Listen, Nikias loves JJJ. He loves mm-hmm. Brandon Clark. He loves Justice <laughs> Winslow. He loves all those guys. So um, that that ultimately, I think, is um, – Nikias, would you say that you're becoming um, – if, if you had to choose a West Coast team, that Memphis is the way you lean in these days? Uh, i probably still lean Denver. For, uh, wow. for reasons. But, uh, yeah, I, I do love what Memphis is building. They have a lot of fun, smart, young talent on that team. So, but let's talk about um, – speaking of young, smart talent, uh, let's talk about an old friend because we, we talked about Portland and you're mentioning all the bigs that they're working in and, and didn't mention one who had a max contract with the Heat. Um, how much do you think Whiteside's going to play for Portland with Nurkic and Collins back? That is a very good question. Like, I feel like there's a role for him to to play. Like, he's still the best rim protector and the best rebounder on the roster. Um, I think Nurkic is a better player because of what he can do in pick and roll, particularly as a um, short roll passer. But I do think that he could still demolish second units. Like, we've seen that in Miami on yeah. a few occasions when Spo said, hey, come off the bench. Um, when he was backing up Amari Stoudemire during the 15th That was his 16th. best role. <laughs> Nikias, that was it. He didn't want to play it, but that was his best role. I mean, he he went through a run there where he was coming off the bench with uh, with Jay Rich and Justice. Well, and didn't has, did, they were didn't dominating Hassan people. Didn't also play pretty good against Anthony Davis? I mean, I know that obviously yes. that's um, not necessarily a fair match, but I feel like he got up for the matchups. Um, mm-hmm. So there could be something there as well in terms of uh, also the rim protection stuff. He could be he could be the the 2020 Roy Hibbert for LeBron. How is he going to handle this though? That's my question. Like I, I mean, it, he hasn't seemed to say any of the negative things at all. But I mean, and they didn't just bring back one big; <laughs> they brought back two bigs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like he's going to go from a guy who thought that he probably should have made the All Star team with his numbers to a guy who's going to be probably playing 15 minutes a game, right? He's pretty much got the Myers Leonard role from last year. Now, which is hilarious considering Myers Leonard is in Miami now. I know. But, um, it it is a contract year for him, 
And we've seen contract year Hassan before. And he's going to be on a playoff team with a bunch of people that he loves and respect. And he could, and if Portland does make the playoffs, it's going to be going against LeBron James, Anthony Davis. And as Leif alluded to, he gets up for the big, for the big name matchups. So I do feel like this in a vacuum is not a role that he loves at all, but I do think he would embrace it in a playoff setting. All right, let's uh, let's get to the East real quick before we close here. Again, follow Five Reasons Sports.com. Also, our YouTube channel. Uh, we're working on something, Nikias. We don't want to we don't want to reveal it yet, but we're working on something. So make sure you subscribe uh, to the YouTube channel, Five Reasons Sports. Uh, in the Eastern Conference, gun to your head right now. Well, actually, we don't want that analogy. Just there's a you got to make a decision. Okay, <laughs> got to make a decision. If I was to tell you Boston's in the finals or Toronto's in the finals, you would go, Greg, with who? Uh, I'm going Toronto in that scenario. Um, I just think that they, they, they have elements of the roster that have been there. There's obviously some offensive issues, but uh, I still just – there's something about Boston I'm not trusting yet, and it may just be my uh, reluctance to back a Brad Stevens coach team. Um, but uh, I'm going Toronto in that scenario. But neither really, ultimately. I, I don't like either to get there. Nikias? I will give a slight edge to Boston. Um, the Kimball Walker knee sin- injury needs to be monitored. But if he's upright, I just think there's a level of shot creation that Boston has that Toronto doesn't. Pasco has been fantastic, but Boston has a lot of like-sized guys that they could throw at him. Mm-hmm. And I just think if you're you're getting to a late game situation, you just need half court buckets. I mean, the ball can go to Jason Tatum, it can go to Jalen Brown off of a closeout, it can go to Gordon Hayward, it can go to Kimba and high pick and roll. In Toronto kind of has to go with the spread, the wealth approach. Mm. And I just don't know if they have enough half-court creation. Mark Gasol is going to help, but I just I just don't know if they have that guy. All right, well, I'm not going to put – I'm not going to put Greg on the spot on this one. I'm going to let Nikias close. Four coaches in the Eastern Conference. Four coaches, okay? Bud, Brad, uh, Nick Nurse, Eric Spolstra. Mm-hmm. Give me a one through four before we close, Nikaias. Okay. Um, we're going to go Spo one, Nurse two. I'll go Stevens three and Bud four. You know, Spo one. All right. I, I was I did not think you were gonna do that. I thought you might go Nick Nurse. Why, why is it Spo over Nick Nurse? Um experience and resume. Okay. That's it. If you have to ask me who did the best coaching job this year, I think it's Nick Nurse. I think we're just looking at the last 12 months who's been the best coach of basketball. I think it's Nick Nurse just because of everything that he does. But I don't think it's necessarily fair to discount what Eric Spolster has done since 2009, basically. Mm. He just well, and there's to- one key metric, one key metric, y'all, Spo uh, outgrading culture. <laughs> <laughs> that's it i decided no guts check for you tonight and uh that was a good decision all right they follow up at nikias nba again be following the youtube channel never know what might show up there uh follow greg sylvander alf and alex uh, will be back actually as i mentioned we're going to be talking to matt moore at hp basketball um he he knows a lot of things but one of the things he knows really well is the nuggets and so we're going to get into that with him as, as the Heat are playing the Nuggets on Saturday. I am going to Orlando as quote unquote tier two media, not living in the bubble, but I will be up there. Uh, I've got just full disclosure. You got to go up there and you got to test um, for good reason. And then you got to wait for the test. So I don't know which is the first game I'm going to be covering, but I will be covering some games next week uh, for five reasons sports. I just, I don't know if everything's going to be processed. Uh, by the Monday game, but hopefully. Anyway, thanks for joining us, guys. Again, follow us on Twitter at Five Reasons Sports. And thanks to Dash Radio and Nothing But Net for having us for the past hour. Thank you for listening to the Five on the Floor on the Five Reasons Sports.